So next, we will talk about the uh, network layer protocols, and after that, we we'll talk about transport and also the application. So what are the common network protocol? Right. So in this example, we can see there's an ARP and there's an ICMP. Uh, in terms of a routing protocol, we have the OSPF and the RIP protocol. And then in terms of a network management protocol, we have something called the SNMP protocol. Um, this is actually the protocol between uh, the uh, network management system and also the NetStream servers. Uh, it's a kind of protocol that communicates with the uh, devices. Okay, so let's look at one by one. So the first protocol we look at the ARP. Now ARP again stands for Address Resolution Protocol. So what does it mean? For example, before sending a packet from a, a, a packet to host C, host A will needs to obtain the MAC address of a host C. So for example, this is host A and uh, this is the IP address and this is the MAC address. Now let's say assume that all these three PCs they are actually just uh, started you know every everybody just boot up from the network and nobody knows who's who is who. So let's say for host A wanted to talk to host C and but first thing is that host A knows about the destination IP address which it, it intended to talk to but it doesn't know but from host A point of view host A doesn't know what is the MAC address so with ARP uh, ARP actually helps to locate all right the uh, or we call it to, to resolve the uh, MAC address of the uh, particular IP address so this is how it works so this is host A so if host A want to look for host C first of all host A, host A at the layer 2 of the Ethernet header, uh, it will actually send to a destination address, MAC address called the FFFFF, which actually stands for broadcast. Okay, and then the source MAC address it actually will carry its own uh, MAC value here. And then in the ARP information here, we call it the uh, this is the type of what we call request. So in the request, it actually says that. Hey, I'm actually looking for 10.0.0.3, I'm from 10.0.0.1, this is my source MAC address, and this is a request operation. So once the packet is sent out, okay, I want you to observe that, do you see there's a traffic here going to host B as well? Right, so actually in fact, host B, host C, host D, whatever, all the network devices in the network, in the same switch network, they will all receive the same ARP request. But however, there's only one host that will be replying to the host A, which is this guy, right? Why, why is the uh, host C replying to host A? Because uh, if you again look back at the, uh, uh, the information about the request, it's, it's actually asking for, I'm looking for 1011, uh, trend 003. So this is the reason why host C says, okay, this is me, and I need to send back the reply we call it the reply ARP reply back to host A so this is a direct communication it's not broadcast okay so this is direct back to host A and it's to claim that okay my MAC address is actually something something CC so from the uh, host C point of view first of all it actually also uh, recorded down the IP address of dot one and also the MAC address of the uh, AA. Okay, it also records down. And after that, once the host A receive the ARP reply, host A will also record something similar uh, 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 to the destination of the ten zero zero three. So in this in this example, uh, host B is actually um, you know after receiving the ARP request, host B will just ignore. Okay, because this is not designated to to the machine host B. So this is actually the reply, and uh, yeah, you can see that the uh, now the source IP address is ten zero zero three, and the destination is ten zero zero one. So this is the uh, MAC address, you know, and this is the a reply. All right, and also same goes for here. 
uh, uh, AA and CC. So after that, the uh, host A receive. Okay. Right. So now there's another type of uh, ARP is what we call gratuitous ARP. Now gratuitous ARP can be used to detect whether an IP addresses conflict. Okay. Now this is actually a, a simple example. Let's say, for example, um, this is a machine host A tries to assign itself with a fixed IP address, which is example 10001 in this case. And before host A assigned this IP address, committed the IP, host A will actually send out this gratuitous ERP to to check and to try to detect whether there's an IP conflict in this in this uh, LAN environment. So uh, this is the source address AA, and uh, you can see there's a source IP 10.0.0.1 and there's a destination 10.0.0.1 as well. And uh, typically you'll find it very funny because you don't actually uh, ask for your own IP address, okay? And uh, the reason of this gratuitous is to detect if somebody responded and said that, hey, I'm a 10.0.0.1, I'm here. So that if host A detected somebody's claim that he, uh, the machine already uses 10.0.0.1, therefore host A will receive an, a message from the machine and it says that IP conflict detected, okay? So that the host A can now decided to change to a different IP address or host A can use, uh, we call it the temporary IP address or sometimes known as what we call APIPA IP address. APIPA stands for Automatic Private IP Address Assignment. So the typical IP address uh, will start from 169.254.something.something. .something .something, okay? Next, let's talk about ICMP. Now, ICMP is, stands for Internet Control Message Protocol. Okay. Now, the main job of this, the main job of this, the main function of this protocol is actually used to transmit error control and the query messages all right so for example if somebody exists in this network by the ip address name and so it actually sends a message out and it expects to, re to receive a return message from the, the receiver okay um, and we can actually use those information to detect uh, like for example the uh, the time the delay from one machine to another machine, how long does it take, and uh, we can also see that um, you know whether the, uh, the 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 destination IP exists or not. Okay, so here are just some examples of the ICMP. Now remember, ICMP is actually just a, a type of protocol. ICMP we call it the, uh, ICMP protocol. Now, one of the application, the software that uses ICMP uh, to perform the uh, the communication is actually called the ping, right? So this is actually an example a ping command, and then from here we, if you do a question mark here, and uh, there are so many options that we can actually perform uh, to 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 configure uh, using the ping command. All right. So basically, ping command is for us to to check. To, to detect whether the destination address, uh, whether they exist or not, and also the uh, delay that we sent a packet and the return, how long does it take? And also the TTL value can also be detected in this case. Right, so this is actually a good response uh, from the uh, ping, right? So if router A ping uh, dot two, and router A receive sequence one, sequence two, reply, right? And this is actually considered a very good message. And the TTL doesn't change, means this is typically uh, we are within the same layer two subnet, the same network, and the time, uh, the first response is actually slower, 
but after that, we have a very cons consistent uh, millisecond of the delay, uh, which is about around 30 milliseconds. Okay, this is the, the speed. Now, the second application, which is a, a, another popular program, is called the trace route. Now, the trace route is actually a program that's designed to actually detect what is the uh, IP address of the router that the, the packet actually went through uh, before reaching the destination. Right, so in this example, like we have two different paths because router A can actually send the packet through two different paths to reach the same destination, but we wanted to know which is the actual path. So we can, we can actually use the trace route to perform the, uh, uh, the, uh, the detection. Okay. This is actually what we receive when we perform a trace route. Uh, so for example, when you type trace route 30.002, um, this is our final destination. And then what we receive is actually the first hop. The command is actually typed from here. So the first hop actually sent that that this is the one that responded and then the second IP that responded is actually from this IP segment and finally is coming from the 30 is the one that responds so in this example we can easily uh, uh, figure out which hop actually it went through so in this example this is not the hop that the, the packet actually went through so we can actually use the ICMP packet to perform a, a trace route now, another protocol that we need to talk about is actually the routing protocol. Routing is the most basic element in the data communications uh, network. It is a process of selecting the path on the network through which packets are sent from a source to a destination. Okay, so this is the, okay, now there's another explanation about routing protocol. Is basically, we call it the, uh, the, the language that between routers and routers to communicate and in order to figure out what is the best path to reach a certain destination okay so in this example we have a multiple different path so the routing protocol the job of the routing protocol is to share this information about all the networks here on how to how they can achieve to 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 a certain destination and a different routing protocol have a different selection criteria and based on the cr selection criteria they will decide this is called the, uh, which one is the best path so let's look at the uh, very brief introduction to uh, an OSPF um, so first of all uh, the, high, the one of the feature of OSPF is actually they do not uh, so they do not uh, generate loops to not generate a loop is actually a good sign because OSPF actually uses uh, this mechanism to calculate the route them is what we call shortest path tree algorithm right so this is the example of the shortest path tree algorithm where there is no loop between like for example this router will then send the traffic back to the same router no 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 this is this is not going to happen in OSPF um, and uh, the, the reason why they can calculate the uh, shortest path tree is because First of all, OSPF they actually collects all the route information from all the routers within the same, uh, we call it the area. So this is the reason why they can uh, know uh, all the information about each and every neighbors in the in the in the OSPF network. Uh, unlike the uh, RIP routing information protocol, uh, for RIP they actually know they only trust whatever that's received from the neighbor. Okay, they, they actually do not know the entire network structure. Okay, so therefore there is a possibility of a loop being generated under the RIP uh, net, uh, protocol. Uh, fast convergence. Now fast convergence means if, X, if let's say one of the network breaks down and uh, one of the network breaks down, they actually will, will really, uh, they will actually quickly recalculate uh, the alternate path so that uh, there is no downtime or maybe there's a, a shortest time for them to um, to recover the traffic good scalability 
um, this is actually now for OSPF the scalability means that how many routers that can be configured within the the network okay the, the answer here is actually almost unlimited <laughs> okay uh, as opposed to RIP uh, there's a maximum uh, distance of 15 hop counts okay so in this example this is called one two three uh, hops or we can call it two hop counts and uh, if it's more than 15 hop counts RIP will not accept the the further one okay um, so there is a limit in uh, under RIP but for OSB there's almost no limit and the good thing is that they also support authentication so authentication basically means if the routers wants to communicate with another routers to share the route information uh, first of all we can configure the authentication that means do you know the password if router A and router B doesn't share the same password then therefore uh, they don't uh, learn from each other okay it's maybe this is because uh, a, a, a hacker may just introduce a router here and try to pretend he is one of the this router is part of the network here and try to influence the network okay so this is actually something which is potentially could happen okay so uh, with authentication is a lot more uh, secure than no authentication next we talk about the SNMP now SNMP stands for simple network management protocol now this protocol is actually designed uh, the, for the machine to talk to NMS now what is NMS NMS stands for network management system right so just imagine if you are working for a, an organization where you need to take care about maybe 100 to 500 different uh, network uh, appliances including the routers and the switches and the wireless LAN and the firewall products and etc etc right so how are you going to manage all of them and how are you going to know where one of the equipment uh, let's say the, the the network link has dropped there's a connection problem or maybe there's a CPU uh, you know uh, too high uh, utilization overheated re equipment this is the reason why we need this component it's called the NMS now NMS is basically just a piece of software uh, where you install on a, a piece of typically on the server it could be virtual or it could be physical uh, so in in, uh, in Huawei's example we have this software by the name called eSight okay so eSight is actually the software uh, that can actually perform an NMS function so um, so eSight um, how does eSight communicates with all these equipment routers switches uh, access switches firewall and etc the answer is through SNMP protocol so this is the architecture of the SNMP protocol so first we have NMS the component we have the actual protocol and then we uh, we will talk to the agent SNMP agent we call it now this is what we call the managed device now again the managed device could be router could be switches could be firewall could be uh, the Wi-Fi equipment and etc etc okay so this agent is the one that communicates with the uh, NMS and typically this port number is actually UDP um, 161 okay and uh, so the NMS will actually will, will start to you know execute uh, will, will start to query some of the information about for example what is your CPU status right now let's say for example the CPU is 70 percent of the utilization or maybe the memory state is uh, let's say 80 percent of the utilization and after that this information will then be sent back to the agent and the agent will send back to NMS so eventually from the NMS uh, screen you should be able to see that now the CPU is 70 percent example now this information is what we call MIB. Now MIB stands for Management Information Base, right? So different type of components of the, or we, or we call it the indicators. We have a different MIPS to perform the query. For example, uh, the memory 
uh, you need to have a certain MIPS to read the memory. If for CPU, you have a specific number just to read about CPU. So this is called the MIPS. Okay. Right, so enterprise network uh, operation and maintenance. Okay. Uh, so this is actually uh, one of the uh, situation where, uh, for example, um, the IT engineer uh, wanted to uh, propose an upgrade. Okay, uh, so uh, for example, IT engineer, uh, it says uh, branch one has exhausted its bandwidth on the XYZ port. We need to purchase a new device to expand the network capacity. And then uh, when, when the engineer proposed, the supervisor says, are you sure we need to expand the capacity? Is, is it because of the network fully optimized or is it like because of the service application? Uh, were deploying uh, rapidly, All right? So uh, as an IT engineer, um, you know, if let's say you have a, a, a well done report, you can actually say that I have a detailed network application development reports for each branches, so that I can present to you, and you know, and uh, using this uh, report to justify the reason why you need to upgrade the network. Uh, it's not because that you you feel like it you feel like you need to upgrade then you you go for the upgrade no um, so this is actually what we call the uh, operation and maintenance especially in the in the large kind of organization uh, right so here with this uh, concept we can understand the traffic trend of all branches and also to identify the devices and branches that needs expansion to analyze the distribution of the band branch traffic, identify the value points for capacity expansion, and also to rank uh, the changes in the branch traffic and also to allocate existing network resources accordingly. Okay, so these are the things that we are able to perform. So let's talk about the how to. How do we analyze the traffic? So the basic concept goes like this. Um, the eSight NTA stands for the Network Traffic uh, Analyzer. It's a software-only solution. Okay. Um, so the good thing about this uh, the function is that no hardware prop is required. You don't need to purchase additional hardware. No additional investment is needed. Uh, um, so the NetFlow, the NetStream, and the SFlow protocol are used to collect and analyze common IP um, packets. Okay, so NetFlow, NetStream, and SFlow are, are the uh, some of the protocols, uh, which is some of them are industry standards and some of them are Huawei standards. Okay, of the protocol, which the uh, device will actually feed the uh, this analyzer about the the, the information about the um, the, the traffic uh, packet okay and uh, this is actually to provide the customer with analysis reports and also to monitor network wide traffic in real time this is a very powerful uh, enterprise uh, operation main and also the maintenance uh, management software so the function is the eSight provides a convenient way to monitor and analyze the traffic by using the IP network traffic information provided by the network device that supports the NetFlow, NetStream, and uh, SFlow, the eSight NTA analyze network wide traffic, provide traffic analysis reports, and display traffic analysis result in the various charts. So we can provide different type of chart, uh, the top ten traffic, the top ten type of different traffic, the maybe let's say the top ten. Of branches that generates the traffic, and etc. Or maybe the top ten user that uses the traffic. Okay, um, so this helps users to learn the network-wide traffic, including the network distribution, and also to detect abnormal network traffic. All right. So this is actually a good point. For example, you know one of the remote branches which typically generate, let's say, x amount of uh, uh, traffic per day. Right maybe in terms of megabyte or maybe like a, a few gigabyte let's say two gigabyte per day kind of traffic and suddenly this traffic spikes up to 10 gigabyte of uh, traffic for a special day 
right? So and then uh, so in this case, the 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 IT engineer uh, can uh, actually analyze uh, what is the uh, the problem. Right. Let's look at the next um, protocol, which is related to the uh, network analysis. Uh, this is called NetStream. So NetStream is a Huawei a patent technology used to collect and distribute the statistics about the network traffic. The NDE, which is, stands for NetStream Data Exporter, sends the obtained statistics to the NSC, which is, stands for NetStream Collector. So this is the exporter and this is the collector for further processing and sends the statistics to NDA which stands for NetStream Data Analyzer for analysis. The results of the analysis provides a basics for network accounting and also for planning. So this is actually the NDE. So example the NDE can be configured at the routers or probably the switch which actually sends the, um, the statistics about the network traffic to a collector okay and the collector can be uh, consolidate all the uh, uh, the uh, statistics from all the physical equipment and then passes to NDA for analysis so eventually the report will be generated by the NDA so the uh, uh, network engineer can then further look at the uh, analysis and to maybe to propose to the management to say that uh, probably we need to upgrade uh, the the, uh, the the network bandwidth or probably need to do some uh, bandwidth shaping uh, based on the uh, report that they actually receive. Now next we will talk about the transport layer protocol right so when we talk about transport protocol we have to talk about the TCP now if you still remember uh, tr uh, transport uh, at the transport layer we have actually two types of uh, uh, mechanism so one is called the TCP which stands for transmission control protocol and another protocol which is called the UDP so remember UDP is called connectionless so U TCP is actually we call it connection oriented now before any packet that is uh, uh, before any packet is actually uh, sent out uh, in the TCP uh, so first of all they need to actually establish what we call the three-way handshake now three-way handshake is just like if you if you try to meet somebody in uh, initially you know normally we will say like hello how do you do what's your name and the other guy will respond hello my name is something something right so this is actually to make sure that the receiver or the destination or the target is actually listening so this is actually what happens so uh, the first packet that sent out uh, from the uh, initiator whoever that starts the connection uh, they will actually send with the TCP flag of what we call the sync SYN sync uh, with a sequence number of let's say A for a number value uh, now the sequence number is also in the uh, TCP header okay so these are the two information which is in the TCP header and uh, once the receiver receive the receiver will send back with sync and acknowledgement the two flags will be enabled and this time you can see that the sequence number will be starting from another number by the uh, the receiver and at the same time the receiver will also acknowledge from whatever number that you sent out for example the number the sequence number you probably send out uh, which is uh, 2001 so the acknowledgement number will send back with 2002 okay and so the sequence number probably let's say uh, 3000 so once the client or maybe the the other the sender the original sender received the uh, uh, the sync and acknowledgement it will send back with uh, acknowledgement so and this time you can see that the sequence number will be actually uh, for example a plus one which is the uh, 2000 the tool and then the acknowledgement this time is for the b plus one which is 3001 so this is actually what we call the three-way initial handshake then only they further 
will continue with uh, the application uh, packet, for example, like HTTP or maybe the FTP, uh, the packet will, the, will be sent out. Okay. Um, so uh, for disconnecting the TCP connection, if once they finish the transaction, for example, FTP. So once they finish the transaction, downloading a files, let's say this is a client, I finish download the files, and the client says, okay, I want to disconnect from the FTP server. And what happens is the client, the whatever, the client will send with a TCP header with the FINT. FINT stands for finish. Okay, and followed by a sequence number which is example of the server and it was sent back with acknowledgement and again it will start with another sequence number B something else and together with acknowledgement A plus one which is from the A here and after that the server will also send things and followed by acknowledgement and this time it was sent with another uh, sequence number and followed by A plus one Okay, and then the uh, the client here will then send back with acknowledgement, and then it will you will actually send with the number a plus one, which is this number here, and then sorry the sequence number is a plus one, and also with acknowledgement c plus one, with to acknowledge whatever that is sent by the sequence number from the server. So this is what we call the four-way handshake. Right, the next layer is called the application layer protocol. So this layer we will talk about a couple of uh, uh, common protocol which is used uh, for the internet purpose. So in, in this case we have the FTP, the web and the mail. Okay. So these are actually the most uh, commonly used uh, uh, internet protocol Okay, and also the DNS. Okay. Uh, but unfortunately the DNS is not using TCP. You, uh, DNS typically use UDP user datagram protocol uh, to perform the, uh, the the name resolution. Right. So let's look at the uh, DNS. Okay. Uh, DNS actually stands for uh, domain name services, and uh, the main function of the DNS is actually to perform the name resolution, um, and also is performed by a dedicated domain name system DNS. Right, and the DNS involves the following types of the server role, the different different, different server. Uh, the first of all, we have something called the root server. So root server is this server, okay? Um, so root server is actually the one that uh, typically we don't see it. Uh, for example, um, let's say I would like to visit www.huawei.com, and did you see there's a dot behind here? Okay, this is actually what we call the root dot. Okay. Now, if, because if we want to learn about DNS uh, domain name, we need to understand that uh, we normally start from the the most right hand part, and we go towards the left hand part. Okay. So, for example, this is the root domain, and then the first level domain, the, or we call it the top level domain, is something like uh, .com, for example, .com, and we have something called .net. Or maybe you have something called the .cn .china, for example. Or maybe you have something called the .in .india. Or maybe you have something called the .us. Okay. Or maybe we have something called the .uk. Okay. So this is what we call the top level domain. Okay. And this dot here behind, the last dot here, is what we call the root server. And all these are called the the sub, you know, or we call it the the first level domain. And after the first level domain, we have the second level domain. For example, like we have something called speedtest.net. Okay, so speedtest will be the second level domain in this case. So remember, when we want to learn about DNS, we have to understand we actually read the DNS name from right to left, towards the left. Okay, so for example, um, so this is actually called the root, the root server, and then we have the top level uh, domain uh, name server, which I just explained here, and then we have also the recursive server, and also we have something called the catch server. Now the recursive server is actually the server which actually allows us to to query the sub of the subdomain, okay? Uh, and the catch server is actually uh, just a 
uh, a server which stores those domain names which already been uh, resolved previously and it is actually to to host uh, to to cop to make a copy okay so this is an example if somebody asks for www.huawei.com first you go through the cre the catch server and the catch server says uh, I don't know about this because nobody asked me about www.huawei.com before but hey let me ask for you on behalf okay so the catch server will then query the internet uh, DNS server which is obviously the root server so the, the, the catch server will then ask the root server hey do you know what's the IP address of www.huawei.com but the root server will say that hey I do not know what is the uh, the full address for www.com but however I can actually provide you with the .com server's IP address so you can ask .com uh, about what is huawei.com so then it actually provides you with the IP and then after that the next step is actually the cache server will then ask hey do you know what is the uh, the, the, the next step is actually step 3 uh, this time the uh, cache server will then go and ask the let's say in this case .com server and you ask that what is the IP address for www.huawei.com okay? and then uh, this server will say mm, to be honest I do not know what is www.huawei.com but however I know what is Huawei.com okay so each server will only know the one level below it but it doesn't not necessarily will have all the full we call it the full qualified uh, domain name so in this case the sorry the top level domain server will come back with the IP address of Huawei.com okay so this is called the the second level so after that the cache server says okay thanks for the information let me ask the the following server so this time it will go to the next server and ask the same question um, hello do you know what is www.huawei.com the IP address and the recursive server eventually this server is the server that that host www.huawei.com and then it actually tells you okay I know what is the uh, IP address of the www.huawei.com a pass back to the cache server and then the cache server then pass back to the client and it says that okay if you want to go to www.huawei.com the actual IP address is something something dot something let's say for example 1.2.3.4 now at the same time the cache server will also keep this information for let's say five minutes in the in the cache pool depends on the the time to leave then if let's say the second time or maybe there's another client wanted to visit www.huawei.com again the cache server says okay let me check in my database if my database contained www.huawei.com and if I know the IP address I will straight away pass the client with the uh, the correct IP address okay so this is actually the the, uh, the functions of the cache servers the recursive servers the top level and the root servers Okay, next we talk about the FTP. So how FTP works? Um, so first of all, FTP stands for File Transfer Protocol. So I think uh, everyone knows File Transfer Protocol is basically um, a protocol which allows us to download or maybe upload uh, certain files to a, to and from a server. Okay, so FTP provides an effective way to upload and download files between server and a client. When used to transmit data, FTP establish a control connections and a data connections between the client and the server. So always remember, in FTP involve two protocols. Sorry, uh, they they, up, they open up two channels. Uh, first channel is what we call the uh, control channel. Now, control channel is basically the channel which, let's say, for example. The client wanted to ask, um, "Hey, uh, what are the files that you have in your directory? All right? Can you, can you give me a listing?" So uh, the um, the user will then send a command uh, from the client, send a command to the server to say that, "Hey, can you give me a list?" And then the server will then uh, send back with the a list of uh, files 
that contained. Now, for example, the, the the client can also say that, hey, I want to I wanted to download a certain file from the server, and then the server would then say, okay, uh, let me process the file and then uh, let me send it to you via data connection. So remember, control connection is basically uh, the connection for the client to send certain commands to the server and the server can then uh, download or sorry to, to send the information via uh, the data channel to the the user okay so the file system here refers to the local file system on the respective uh, machine could be the client and also the server now let's look at the uh, transmission mode about FTP now FTP supports two types of transmission mode the, the first is what we call active mode and another one, another one is called the passive mode now in the active mode which is used primarily default um, so the client sets up the, con the control connections and the server set up the data connections channel so remember the point in the passive mode okay as opposed to the passive mode the client set up both connections so user can switch the mode through commands okay so let's look at the first one is called the uh, um, the uh, FTP connection set up in the active mode okay now first of all uh, as we know that FTP uses a port 21 in actual fact port 21 we are only correct half okay because port 21 is actually used for only the control connections so typically as, as an FTP client uh, they will actually send uh, to a certain IP address of the FTP server with the port 21 and this is where they actually establish the authentication mechanism let's say the server will ask what is your username please provide the username please provide the password so that the client can enter the name and the password if everything is correct the server say okay welcome you can now uh, start to browse my my servers and you can start download some files okay so this is actually the control connections um, and for active active mode uh, the server is the one that actually uh, will, will, will use its port number for example in this case port 20 and then try to establish uh, the connection the port connection to the client okay this we call this a passive mode sorry we call this active mode so the server is the one that sent what will set up we call here the setup the data connection so the port number determined by the server over here now the second mode is what we call the passive mode now the passive mode means okay first of all control connection is still using port 21 all right then after that the client will says okay I want to to go to I want to enter into what we call the passive mode now in the passive mode the client will actually uh, will, will actually suggest the port number uh, will be used okay so that the um, so you can look at the arrow here so the, the, the passive mode they will actually include the port number so the server will, will agree with the port numbers and uh, so during this time uh, normally in the firewall most of the modern firewall they can actually understand the uh, the communication uh, handshake between the client and the server by FTP so that the firewall can actually open up the respective port which is meant for the data connections okay so this is what we call the passive mode transmission right the next is what we call the um, HTTP and HTTPS okay so HTTP stands for hypertext transfer protocol this is actually a protocol which is the most commonly used protocol today where we actually download all we are using our browser our favorite web browser and we type in a certain URL here and then suddenly we can see some nice graphic we look at some nice animation and then there's a button here for it to click you know this is actually the uh, uh, the protocol that used by the uh, browser to a web server 
Now from the web server point of view, the web server basically is sending uh, a type of file, what we call the HTML hypertext markup language um, file is to describe all these uh, uh, parameters including the graphic, including the text, the wording, uh, the animation, the videos or the link. You can click the link to something else, to somewhere else. Um, so hypertext markup language, uh, hypertext markup language is actually the, is a file. Uh, normally it's, in, it's a text file that used to describe the file. And uh, URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator. Okay, URL, which is this one. Uh, this is called the address, Uniform Resource Locator. So typically, uh, H U URL will start begin with something like this http colon slash slash which is for the non uh, secure channel to browse a website and sometimes you can also use https it depends on the the website some of the website supports uh, https which i find them more nowadays most of the website will support https and also sometimes we can also use a uh, protocol url like ftp colon slash slash uh, to browse an, an FTP website. So they, all of these are called the Uniform Resource Locator. So uh, this is uh, depends. If the client uh, browsing to a website which is a non-secure website, they will use HTTP, which I just described earlier. If you're browsing to some banking website or maybe Facebook or Gmail, typically we will use HTTPS. Okay. All right. so how does it work? HTTPS now, HTTPS is a stateless protocol that uses request response method for communication. Okay, so that means it has to be request by the client uh, to for a certain web page, so that the uh, the server can then respond with the certain web pages. So this is normally how it starts. Now, the client using the web browser, for example, Google Chrome or maybe Firefox, it will actually send what we call the the client hello packet to the web server to a certain IP address and typically um, it will send something like HTTP we type something like HTTP uh, www.huawei.com example now remember the first step is actually the DNS uh, resolution because first of all the, the, the client doesn't know where is the IP address of the actual web server so the DNS will come in place so to perform the, the name resolution to IP address so that the HTTP, uh, the, the, the client will then use the IP address and send the, the hello packet to the web server. So upon receiving the request, so the web server will then send back with a response says, okay, what can I do for you if you, are, you want to establish a HTTP session with me? And then after that, the step three is that the client says, I want to download XSX file, whatever file name, which is mentioned here. So this example, get is actually the, the, the command to request. HTTP colon slash slash class is actually something like www.huawei.com or you can use class.com, whatever, followed by slash, followed by the actual file. Now, typically, the file ex uh, the file name for the common web server are something like index.html, or maybe for the IIS, it's actually called default.htm. So these are the two very common, uh, the first file, the very, very first file for any website, they will actually publish using index.html or maybe default.html. Then sometimes, depends on the server, uh, if the server requests that, hey, can we go into HTTPS uh, uh, mode? And uh, if let's say uh, the, 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 after they negotiate, they say, okay, we'll go into HTTPS. And then the server may ask you, do you have a key? And then uh, step three says, yes, I have a key. Uh, this is for the encryption. And after that, step six is that the server will then send the, the file, the actual file, the main page to the client. So this is actually the uh, HTTP process. So basically there are only two types of packets. Uh, one is called the request packet and uh, then the one that from the server back to the client is what we call the response 
packet. Okay, the next protocol is the SMTP, POP3, and the IMAP. Now, SMTP stands for Simple Mail Transport Protocol or Transfer Protocol, and POP3 it stands for Post Office Protocol, and also the IMAP stands for Internet Mail Access Protocol. Okay. And um, so first of all, SMTP defines how a PC sends an email to an SMTP server and how the mail is transferred between SMTP server. Now POP3 and the IMAP specify how a PC uh, can manage to download the mail on the mail server through a client software. Now SMTP and POP3 or IMAP are deployed on the mail server by an administrator or an engineer and also the mail client software such as Outlook or maybe Foxmail or maybe Thunderbird uh, are normally installed on the user PC. So in this example PC1, let's say PC1 uses a Microsoft Outlook, right? And then the PC1 would then compose a message and then send to, uh, let's say, for example, um, somebody at Okay, let's say uh, Julie at Huawei.com from PC1. Okay, so this email from the local uh, Outlook it will then send to the SMTP server. Okay, this is uh, from the sender perspective, and this is the port number they will actually use, port 25. Now this is the uh, SMTP server. Let's say uh, within the organization. Uh, of uh, ABC company, whatever. So once the uh, the SMTP server receive, it will then query the DNS, and it will query a special record on the DNS. We call it the MX record, MX records of Huawei.com. Okay, and this MX records will then from the DNS will then tell you. The actual IP address. It will tell the server the actual IP address that you need to contact. So in this case, the SMTP server will know where is the IP address of the receivers, which is Huawei.com, the SMTP server. So this, in this case, this is a Huawei.com uh, email server, and then it will encapsulate the mail into SMTP message and then send it to the SMTP server. Now, upon receiving the uh, the email, so the the SMTP server and the Huawei.com, it will check all the necessary stuff. For example, like it, does the user Julie exist uh, in the server, um, and also you will check something like the spam. Is this a spam mail? Or maybe you will check what's the content of the email. Does it contain uh, any attachment? If there's attachment. Uh, if it's an exe file, probably the email server will then scan through and to see if there's any, any viruses. So if everything is okay, the SMTP server after that will probably send to another type of server. It's called the uh, POP3 server or maybe the IMAP server. Okay, IMAP or the POP3 server. This is actually meant for to store the 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 email at the user mailbox. So um, so PC2 will then, if PC2 will check, open up, uh, let's say for example, the same software called the Outlook, and the PC2 uh, check, click on the button, click send and receive, and uh, suddenly PC2 said, okay, you got a new email, and after that PC2 will then can download the message using POP3 protocol, or maybe the IMAP protocol, and PC2 can read the message. So PC2 uh, user or maybe Julie can decide to, whether to reply the message back to the PC1. Okay, so this is actually how it works. So from the in internet uh, uh, point of view, port 25 is actually the more the most important port for every email to be sent to from a sender to the destination domain, not the port 3, and neither the IMAP. Okay. All right, so we come to the end of the session. So let's talk about some uh, quiz. Uh, which of the following is not the TCP/IP models? 
uh, remember we spoke about the OSI model versus the TCPIP models and remember in the TCPIP model we actually uh, summarize into only four layers instead of OSI seven layers so now data link layer is included uh, transport layer and the application layer are included in the TCP4 uh, layer model except the session layer okay so remember the question now the quiz question is actually asking for not in the TCPIP model which of the following packets is the first packets of the TCP three-way handshake <laughs> okay we just mentioned this before and answer is very simple is actually B answer is B okay sync is the packet now remember the first is from the initiator it will send the sync packet and the second packet send back is sync with uh, acknowledgement and then the third packet is actually the acknowledgement packet so these are the three-way handshake right so in summary we in this session we talk about the TCPIP uh, architecture we spoke about some of the common network protocols from the trend from the network layer protocol to transport layer the TCP and then to the application uh, layer protocol and we also spoke about some examples FTP HTTP DNS and also the SMTP SMTP all right so thank you for